Welcome back to Trilogy's channel. Today, we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into one of the most popular and most sought after watches of all time. And that watch is, of course, the Rolex Daytona. The Daytona, of course, needs no introduction. It's one of the most recognizable and sought after watches of all time. Many influential people and celebrities have chosen the Daytona as their watch of choice. And it only really dawned on me this video topic the other day when I was explaining to a client the difference between a super luminova and chroma light lumen on a Daytona that many people may not know the little differences uh, between Daytona years and models and references. Uh, so I thought it might be good to make a video to explain that uh, for people who are interested in the Daytona and uh, learning a bit more about the history of it and uh, the differences that can make one a lot more collectible and expensive than the other. So we're gonna delve into that today. Today I've got four Daytonas uh, iterations to show you. The four I've chosen to show are the Daytonas that all have a self-winding movement. This starts with the Zenith Daytona. I have one here today, uh, which is a 90s model uh, C-Serial. Uh, the Zenith was the first self-winding uh, Daytona. A lot of people don't know this fact, and this history seems to be a bit forgotten because for decades now, Rolex have done everything in-house, but this wasn't always the case. It wasn't so long ago, but it was long enough ago that most people have sort of forgotten this part of Rolex's history. The Rolex Daytona using the Daytona name was originally released in 1963. And from this point up until the Zenith Daytona, all the movements were uh, manual wound movements until the Zenith, which, had a self, which has a self-winding movement. Uh, it's crazy to think that some of these, Paul, uh, some of these uh, vintage Daytonas, such as the Paul Newman reference 6239 uh, and others of that category and vintage era uh, go for these crazy prices, 200, 300, 400,000 and they're all a manual wind. But as we all know, the collectability of watches has no upper bound. As the years went on, the trend and the demand moved away from manual wound watches and Rolex saw they had to take action and action they took. In 1988, Rolex released the Zenith Daytona. It's referred to as the Zenith Daytona because Rolex used a movement that was first used in the Zenith El Primero, but they took it and modified it quite a lot. And that's where the Rolex movement number 4030, which powers the Zenith Daytona came from. The 4030 was a great movement, and this led the way for Rolex to produce their first in-house movement, which is the 4130, which is a powerhouse of movement, a great movement. It's still used in Daytonas today across all the lines, the Platinum and the current production uh, 116500 LN. So it's obviously a great movement, which has lasted uh, over 22 years without any modifications or problems. The ZF Daytona range can have a plethora of differences, which can change prices, uh, collectability, price points, um, which I won't delve into here today, uh, but we can do so on another video, uh, which, because it will take a while, this is more about the Daytonas. If you'd like to see a video, uh, if you'd like to see a video about the Zenith Daytona and the differences, the price points, let me know in the comments and I'll be sure to make one for you soon. Today I'll talk about the Zenith Daytona and the 116520 pre-ceramic um, for now and how you can tell them apart without looking at the papers and the reference number. One of the most obvious differences um, and probably the biggest uh, giveaway would be the dial. The dial on the Zenith Daytona uh, has a sort of a contrasting sub-dials on the Zenith um, as opposed to on the later Daytona, the 116520. For example, on the white dial Zenith, which is the one I have here, the subdials are black, um, and on a later model, 116520, the subdials have got a silver, uh, silver outline. So that's one of the big differences you can tell. Also, if you was to pick up a Zenith, you'd notice that the bracelet is slightly different. For some reason, the links feel a bit tinny. Um, obviously, they don't have the solid end links that was, uh, came in a bit later. Also, another giveaway would be the clasp. The Zenith Daytona has a bit of a bitty clasp that you can see, um, so it's sort of chopped into bits. You can see it up on screen now, whereas the later 116520 has a more solid, robust, long clasp, um, which has the half a link at five mil adjustment, which is pretty good if your, uh, obviously your wrist swells in the evening or go on holiday. It gives you a little, another five millimeters to play with uh, to make your watch more comfortable in the warmer climates. Another difference and something that is pretty interesting uh, would be the loom on these watches. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the loom is uh, what we refer to when you can see on the watch, the luminescent coating, uh, when you, either in a dark place or at night when it starts to light up. Uh, Rolex used Tritum for many, many decades um, on uh, looms on, across all their lines. Uh, but Tritum as, uh, Tritum, as we know, is a radioactive element which has a half-life of 12 years. Because of this and its radioactivity, Triton was actually outlawed in 1998, which meant uh, Rolex had to find a new coating for their hands, uh, which they did. They found that in the form of Superluminova. So there was a two year period from 98 to 2000 where Zenith Daytonas were produced with a Superluminova. So this would be a really hard and difficult watch to get and it would be highly collectible, but all Zenith Daytonas usually are. The P-Serial is the most collectible and this actually has the Superluminova coating. The ZF Daytona I have here is a C-Serial, so this has the Tritum coating. So I've uh, got some, my photo up on screen now for you to see the color of the Tritum coating and we can now and soon we'll compare that 
to the coating of the Superluminova that I have on the 116520 here. I'm not actually selling this Zenith or any of these four day toners. Um, I just got them out um, from my personal investment collection just to show you all and talk about the differences. Uh, I, I thought it would be quite important to add this into the video. I often film and discuss uh, watches and investments and give advice on that. And I don't think it would be fair for me to uh, give that advice unless I actually had some skin in the game. I have personally put my money where my mouth is across the Daytona range. And these four you see at the front of this box here, they're all my investment pieces. Um, for obvious reasons, the Zenith, and you'll learn why the other ones are investment pieces of mine as well. So I thought I'd just put that in there just so you guys know I am in, in the invest, watch investment game as well as the watch sales game as well. I believe in holding all of the iterations of the self-winded Daytona. I'll have a great chance of capital appreciation, which is why I bought these four and I'm holding on to these four. Uh, the Zenith Daytona that I have here as a full set in good condition like my one, you'd struggle to get one for less than £30,000 today. So moving on to the Zenith, we move to the reference number 116520. Uh, as you can see the two in the middle of the box and up on screen now. Uh, this is the referred to as the pre-ceramic Daytona because the bezel on it um, is obviously a stainless steel bezel and the followed subsequent model was the ceramic Daytona. So we refer to this as the pre-ceramic. Uh, it had some changes, uh, but primarily it's a stainless steel Daytona was available in both black and white. The subtitles across are either black or white are all silver. So that's how you can tell it apart from the Zenith. Uh, it was the first watch to use Rolex's updated 4130 movements, and it's the first fully in-house Rolex Daytona. E even within the 116520 range, there are little differences that can make differences to the price. For example, when, when the 116520 was first released, Rolex was still using paper as the guarantee, um, whereas today, obviously, we are used to the cards. But uh, older models on paper um, and who have the old class before 2008 are worth less than models that have got the card and uh, a newer class, which was post-2008. Also, uh, what's quite interesting is the uh, looms. Rolex changed the loom, which they used from 1998 to 2014, which was the Super Luminova, which is the green loom that you can see up on screen now. And in 2014, they changed that over to Chromalite, which has got that lovely, vibrant blue loom. And the Chromalite version, which was only produced from 2014 to 2016, when the 116520 was discontinued. So it's very, very hard, and high, uh, it's very, very hard to find the 116520 with the Chromalite, and it was a highly collectible model. One other thing to note about the 116520 is the uh, often referred to as the APH dial. This is something that a lot of you may not be aware of. On the 116520, there was a number of dials that became a misprinted dial um, and were left the factory that way. It's referred to as the APH dial, um, which I'll explain to you now. If you look up on screen uh, on the Daytona, the word cosmograph appears at the bottom of the four lines. And uh, on the APH dial, there's a space between the R and the APH. It's only a small space, but there is a space indeed. And this spacing, is a wrist print from Rolex. And as we all know, misprints are highly collectible and highly desirable from Rolex. So the APH dial is one of those. I, I made a very proud investment myself a few weeks ago. I uh, managed to acquire, I just got offered it, but out of the blue, I wasn't looking to buy it, but it just fell into my lap, so I had to buy it. I managed to inquire this one here. This is a Rolex uh, Daytona reference 116520. It's a 2016, which is the last year of production. Um, so it's got the new card, it's got chroma light, it's an APH dial, and it's a full set. It is the collector's dream. I was so happy when I offered it and I just paid a lot of money just to own this piece because I know it would be worth a lot more in years to come. I don't think I'll ever sell it, but it's unworn condition at the moment and I'm just gonna keep it in the safe and see what happens to the price in 10, 15 years, who knows. But for now, that's what I'm gonna be keeping. So the final watch in the Daytona range and the current production model is this one. It's the Ceramic Daytona, reference number 116500LM. This one here is often referred to as the Panda because of the black and white coloring. The uh, 116500 obviously followed on from the 116520 we were just discussing um, and with a few improvements on it, such as the ceramic bezel. In the last decade or so, Rolex have been Im improving their sports watches uh, by replacing the old metal bezels such as stainless steel, and stainless steel on the Daytona and aluminum on subs and GMTs for uh, the better material, which is ceramic. The benefits of ceramic is that it's scratch resistant and this is especially prominent and noticeable on the Daytona. For example, on some of these older Daytonas, if you see an older one that's uh, been, had a bit of wear, it will pick up a lot of scratches on it. Um, and these scratches can't really be polished out without removing the enamel. And then the watch really starts to look a bit tired and a bit horrible. Um, and once you remove the enamel, you can't really put it back. So the good thing is with the ceramic Daytona, it's obviously scratch resistant and uh, you can't really ruin the bezel on it anymore unless you really crack it, in which case you'll need a whole new bezel anyway. Um, yeah, the ceramic bezel is obviously black and I think it works really, really well uh, with the white Daytona. Uh, they've now brought back the black sub dials that we saw on the Zenith. So you get a really, really nice contrast that just looks beautiful on this Panda Daytona. And I think it works really well. 
I, th I think it's probably the best looking steel Daytona, and it also um, still uses the chroma light, which I mentioned in the 116520. And I think that vibrant blue is the nicest loom on it. Um, so I think all in all, it's a fantastic improvement. It's a, it's a shame it's one of those watches that you just can't buy from Rolex. Um, obviously, this is the only one here today that is a current production model, um, but it's going to be very difficult to get. Uh, waiting list is in excess of 10 years or indeed closed. So if you're looking for a data, uh, any of these Daytonas, as I said, these are mine uh, for investment purposes, but I will be able to purchase, uh, I will be able to source any of them for you. Let me know what you think of the Daytona in the comments below. Which one's your favorite and which one you would have if money was no object. Thanks for tuning into Trilogy. And don't forget, if you're looking for a new watch, phone Frankie first.